Hi everyone and welcome to the Master Wildlife Filmmaking Podcast. Before we get started with this episode's guest, I would like to let you know that the Master Wildlife Filmmaking Mentoring Program has now launched and is open. If you're an avid wildlife filmmaker, wildlife photographer transitioning to filmmaking, a scientist looking to use filmmaking to widen your reach, or if you're just starting out in your wildlife filmmaking journey, then this is for you. You can find out more information about the Master Wildlife Filmmaking Mentoring Program at jakewillers.com forward slash mentorship. That's jakewillers, J-A-K-E-W-I-L-L-E-R-S dot com forward slash mentorship. You're listening to the Master Wildlife Filmmaking Podcast, Episode 20. This episode, I'm speaking with Dusty Hewlett. Dusty completed a bachelor's degree in business management at Brigham Young University in Utah, where he also minored in media arts. He's taken a choose-your-own-adventure approach to graduate school, starting a number of businesses, producing independent films, and spearheading other ambitious creative endeavors. He served as the creative director for multiple startups and ad agencies, where he has led teams in creating impactful results for both corporate clients and champions of social causes, domestically and abroad. Dusty's viral campaigns have surpassed 10 times returns on their budgets and carved out substantial brand awareness overnight in crowded markets. Dusty has had the privilege of, as he puts it, puking his guts out on Everest Base Camp, hiding from rebels in the bushes of the DRC-Uganda border, filming the largest lava lake in the world, eating the wrong part of a fish in the Philippines, photographing critically endangered mountain gorillas, being charged by a bull water buffalo, and crawling headfirst into occupied bear dens. A believer that his small town upbringing in Idaho provided the constraints in which his creativity could learn to thrive, he's anxious to combine his diverse experience to provide outstanding creative solutions for clients and causes both big and small. Dusty's latest film, Bears of Durango, centers around a team of wildlife researchers who are in search of the reasons why bear-human conflicts are increasing exponentially in Durango, Colorado. Over the past year, Bears of Durango has been doing the festival circuit and has so far been awarded Best Human Wildlife Interaction Film and the Spirit Award by the International Wildlife Film Festival, Best Conservation Film by the Lookout Wild Film Festival, Best Audience Choice Award for Best Documentary at the Durango Independent Film Festival, and most recently it received the Fan Favorite Award at the Wild and Scenic Film Festival in Nevada City, California. And that's where I caught up with Dusty. Dusty, thanks so much for joining me on the Master Wildlife Filmmaking Podcast. Yeah. How are you this morning? Oh, well, top notch, sitting on the deck of a fancy winery here. It's uh, nice, isn't it? A mug of water in front of me, a beautiful view of trees in the winter. That's right. It's beautiful. So we're at the Wild and Scenic Film Festival. It's uh, January 2020. You have been doing the festival circuit, I believe, for quite some time now. And I, I, I believe when I heard you speak yesterday after your film, you said that this is your last festival. Yeah, yeah. We have uh, concluded actively submitting our film to festivals after about, it's been about a year, coming up on a year and a half now, and uh, it's time to transition out of festival mode. We've had a great run. Um, this is this this is a good note to end on, I think, here, as we transition toward trying to get that wider distribution, the wider reach for our projects. So, yeah, so happy to be here and enjoying one last uh, go of the festivals before before we get to work on the next part here, try to transition. First of all, let's just give the listeners an idea of your film, Bears of Durango, that you've been doing the festival circuit with. Can you just give us kind of a summary of what Bears of Durango is about? Yeah, so Bears of Durango dives headfirst into bear dens with Colorado Parks and Wildlife researchers. They're looking into why is it that we have this exponential increase in conflicts between bears and humans in the state of Colorado, and what can we do to mitigate that? So they were tasked with a pretty big question set by, by the state-level organization, and they spent six years in Durango, Colorado, 
um, looking into those issues and, and trying to figure out, you know, answers to those questions that can be uh, actionable items for municipalities, for, you know, laws and, and, and all, you know, to inform better policy, essentially. And uh, I, it was very close to my heart because I've done a lot of black bear filming around Tahoe, very similar kind of urban bear um, filming. And so it was very, it was really interesting to see the kind of footage that you guys were getting. Very similar, just a completely different state, different city, but all the same problems. I was fascinated by the fact that Durango have taken it so seriously and that they are bear proofing the entire city as I, uh, in terms of trash cans. They're going to distribute bear proof trash cans. That's fantastic because that's not something that happens everywhere. So it's nice to see there's some impact and outcome. Yeah, yeah. It was, uh, so this, 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 the study has been commissioned by the state level organization, but as a local community, Durango's really embraced the work of the researchers there. And, um, as a result, as you learned in the film, uh, that adoption locally is a great sign for what can happen as the researchers are out presenting to other communities and as the research finds its way into scientific papers. They've published 10 papers at this point, and hopefully as managers read those papers, they reconsider some of their practices, and municipalities have statistical um, backing for the expenditures associated with bear-proofing efforts and, and things of that nature. So even this last week, some of those folks that, that appear in the film have been presenting to other communities in Colorado at those communities invitation before their city councils about how to address those issues. One of them was in Steamboat Springs this week, so opposite end of the state. Um, and But people are taking note of the work that they did in Durango. And do you feel that your film has had impact directly on that situation or is it too early? At, it's, uh, you know, you're just doing the festival circuit, so it's not actually out there yet to the public or how is yeah, that working? That's a great question. So the, the festival circuits acted as an opportunity for us to generate as many contacts as possible. The, the isolation associated with making a film of this nature is fairly incredible. I mean, you're really under a rock while you're getting it done. And so to get out to the wider public, to have something that people can finally see after years of working on it, to, to j drum up those contacts and some of that momentum, um, th I, th for us, that's then generated interest from policymakers and folks tied to policymakers and folks that consult policymakers that we've met through the festival circuit. And because of that buzz in the media and the PR and things that we've been able to generate through the festival circuit, folks in positions of power have requested the opportunity to see the film which has been that's really fantastic. interesting yeah it's been really interesting so the so what that's led to and this is very recent for us is being able to present the film to state level folks in charge of research um, state level people who have their hands on the levers of policy making regarding hunting quotas and things of that nature it's it's we have some leads to get it in front of folks at the governor's office. So um, that's all kind of starting to unfold now. And it's been because of that buzz we've been able to create in the festival circuit that those conversations are happening. And what's nice is they're being at times we're being solicited for the opportunity to see instead of us having to go bang on doors and, and try to weasel our, our way in the back. Uh, there's a there's a front door entrance when your your film starts to make noise regionally i mean that's the best you could possibly wish for for your film i mean creating impact getting it to the right people and really them asking for it that that's fantastic um uh you know congratulations on that Thanks. i saw the film with you yesterday my film actually played at the festival just before yours yeah so we were there together which was really nice and you know i loved the way that you took a subject which can be pretty dramatic in terms of what we've done with the subject before it, it's dramatic and that's because you've got a black bear breaking in someone's home and you know you've got uh, footage in there of a bear looking inside a fridge it's standing up and it's opening the fridge door like a human would and and you know we we all know the kind of devastation that's going to happen to your house once a bear breaks in but you took a very light-hearted approach the music that um, you had just just gave it a light-hearted feel so that it kind of took us on an emotional ride of like we're laughing one minute but then going uh oh this this is this isn't good for us all the bears what 
was the inspiration to take that kind of uh, take us on that kind of ride or journey through your film? Yeah, so I, I'm a nature enthusiast. I'm not a trained biologist, and I think for me to tonally take some kind of authoritative stance seemed inappropriate because of that. Instead, I was the film started as an, in, in, in its interest. Let's see, how can I phrase this? Essentially, we, we kick things off by just being interested in the researchers' processes. Here you have people crawling headfirst into bear dens with a tranquilizer that takes 15 minutes to set in. That's so bizarre. Right. Uh, and, and some of that footage is crazy because they're in very, very small. They're going back in just to give the listeners some idea of, of what it looked like. Some of the, I think the researcher said that one of the caves was about 35 meters deep and it's maybe two foot wide, 18 inches wide. They're ba barely pushing or squeezing themselves through. The first den I went to, they were tying ropes around the ankles of the researcher who was going in with the jab pole to be able to yank her out in the event of an issue. <laughs> that, that was their system, right? And we're so, talking, how, how big is this bear? It's like a two, 300 pound bear? In this case, there were two bears in that den. Wow. Um, a yearling and a mother, a sow. Um, so with that, you know, my interest was in the process. And so to get back to your question before, I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm observing this the same way you are when you watch the film. Holy cow, this is crazy, right? Right. And then uh, as we, you know, our Kickstarter was successful and as we got some localized PR that was able to, we were able to solicit home videos from local residents, every day I'd open my inbox and be like, oh my gosh, this is crazy, right? And so I think tonally it seemed appropriate for us to keep that tone of you're, you're along for the ride with us as the filmmakers to witness this seemingly absurd process but that's that's you know unearthing some really important scientific discoveries debunking myths about bears helping better inform policies and expenditures for municipalities um but along the way it, you know that that's still a barrel of rotting fish completely full of maggots that t literally takes your breath away when they pull the <laughs> lid off when, to show you the bear bait and, and, and you could you could um, feel that with the reaction of the audience. I mean, when she took the lid off, and, and just for our listeners, it's a, a barrel, like a 55-gallon barrel, full of rotting fish and meat covered in maggots, and that's what they're using to bait the bears in, right? And the audience just, oh, gosh. It's almost like you could smell it. You can hear me in the footage groaning as that's well. Right. So, <laughs> so, yeah, I think tonally then, you know, uh, that was important. But I, I also think, you know, bears are a charismatic species, and so um, they're they're an easier. I think you know it's it they're they're kind of the the gateway drug to thinking about how we interact with w wildlife, right? People like bears. A sure. lot of people do. Yeah. And so if you can kind of share with them some of the fun and the lovable aspects of bears, while also you know the sobering statistics about what's happening with them and what may happen with them if we don't change the way that we manage them and the way that we interact with them as we develop their habitats. Um, then I th we, we wanted to walk that line of, hey, it's okay to laugh. And then it's okay to have a really somber moment. And, but then it's okay to laugh again. And, and so that, I think kicking things off with, you know, laughable scenes and, and absurd, you know, encounters and things of that nature that are, you know, inherent when bears and people come into contact with one another. Uh, we wanted to diffuse any tension or any preconception that we would, people would have coming into the production to be able to, hey, it's okay, let's all open up, let's laugh about this first, and then let's consider, and we're gonna walk you through what we learned as we went along with these researchers. So that was, I think, some of the mentality that went into why you'll, you'll witness so much levity um, punctuating, you know, stark statistics that come up along the way as well. Well, it worked really, really well because it, it did get a great reaction. People were laughing. I mean, it was a packed house, standing room only, People were laughing and then suddenly gasping. And, and that's the emotional ride you want to take people on. You want them to be kind of peaking and troughing between, you know, sad, happy, you know, funny. Um, or it, it worked really, really well. Now, you had quite unprecedented access to get the footage you got. And um, I, I'm aware, you know, the kind of relationships you have to have with biologists and people working in the field to to know and, and to be trusted that you're going to be there filming everything going on 
and potentially some stuff they don't want filmed, right? Um, but it seemed that you were literally part of their, uh, I think there were four of them, four researchers most of the time, and it felt like you were the fifth part of that crew. How did that come about? That's a great question. Um, the, <laughs> I, I think we slipped in the back door. I mean, there was no credential of mine that, that should have really opened that door. I, I did film a deer study and I cut together like a little sizzle from that and sent that over to them. And I think that, you know, showed, oh, this person's serious about, you know, their craft and, and interested in wildlife. Um, but the initial ask was two days. Four years later, I mean, I got a lot more than two days with, right. with these folks, right? Right. So you initially just going out to film, you were asking them, can I come and film for two days? Yeah. And it was, a, <laughs> I, I was friends with, so I was, one of my friends living in Jackson Hole, her brother was working as like a, as under the head researcher on the study. And so he vouched for me having never met me. <laughs> I showed up and slept on a stranger's floor and got there so late that I didn't even meet them and then showed up in the parking lot the next morning to go to a bear den with, with him who I'm meeting for the first time who's vouched for me and three other researchers who are so introverted at the time that I thought they hated my guts. Right. <laughs> I was just like, oh man, these people really dislike the fact right. that I'm here with this camera. Yep. Um, turns out they're just very quiet. Yes. Um, yep. But uh, but they, yeah, so I mean it was it was way outside of my comfort zone. It was a big ask and it was kind of going out on a limb borrowed a camera from the ad agency I was working with, s literally slept on a stranger's floor at, that he helped coordinate and, uh, and off he went. But it was the second time I went and filmed that the head researcher, I was filming in the car as we were driving along asking her questions and she said, we need to talk. And I said, great. And I'd point the camera at her to talk. And she says, no, we need to talk. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Turn off the camera. Right. And, uh, and that's when we had, you know, a little exchange about sure. this is not going to end up on when animals attack. Right. And yep. we don't just give people access to this with that, without knowing where that content's headed. Sure. Um, so it took time to build the rapport. But, you know, some things, <laughs> some funny things happened along the way that helped build that rapport. One thing in particular, um, the organization that had showed up to film the day before with a different, when they went to visit a different den, had so terribly botched the opportunity that they had then the researcher was so frustrated with them that she thanked me for my professionalism and was so grateful that I was taking this seriously and that I was working so hard to get you know the footage and whatnot she could perceive that difference so taking you know when you ask for that opportunity I think the lesson I learned there is people can see the grit you're putting into it that I'm close to vomiting from trying to keep up the, with them <laughs> right. with all this camera gear, <laughs> yeah. huffing up the mountain in waist deep snow, um, and uh, and and taking it you know very seriously. I, I think that it's such a good point here that um, you know I've heard this many times and from other filmmakers, but also I've had this happen to me where I've gone along and they they think that I'm untrustworthy based on their previous experience with a filmmaker, and I, I think it's a very valid point that um, as filmmakers we need to be very aware of our actions when we're out filming how we convey ourselves to those people how we act around them um, I've seen filmmakers get really in people's faces of like biologists trying to work in, in the instance of like with a bear you know they're down there they're putting a collar on they've got a lot at stake they don't need a camera person getting in their way or say, oh, could you could you just stop and do that again? <laughs> you know, right. rather than just, you know, cinema verite, just watching. I've seen so much of that. And it, it, it unfortunately reflects so badly and poorly on filmmakers in general. And I think a good note here is as filmmakers, we have a responsibility to conduct ourselves in a professional way. And whether it's your first time or you've been doing it a long time, you know, you soon get to know that you don't get very far if you get in people's faces and you do things wrong. You know, you get a bad name quickly um, and then it rubs off. And, and the next time a film crew comes along, it can have a bad, bad uh, rap for them. Yeah. And, and, in, and especially when you're working with someone like I was with this, you know, associated with a state organization, ethically, they, I can't pay them. They can, they couldn't accept payment for their time, for their the extra effort that it took to make their story available to me, for the time with the interviews and whatnot. It's a conflict of interest. And so I am a nuisance to them until my content that I generate from this can somehow 
elevate their efforts. And of course, with you said four years. Had they seen anything in that four years, or did was it just like we hope that Dusty's going to make something we like after this four years? After the first time I went and filmed with them, I cut together a, a sizzle that okay. I sent back to them, and they saw a little bit of that. And that's when I thought, hey, this might be really great to go back. I, I went to a den visit, like two different dens, the first filming. And then I was like, well, how do they get the collars on the bears in the first place? That's in the summertime when they're trapping. So I sent this sizzle that I cut together and said, what would you consider letting me come back and film the trapping process? And we could maybe follow these, this one family of bears that we visited, one of the dens, to see how many cubs make it to the next year. And I thought, that's a great short film, and it punctuates itself, and we show the full process. Um, turns out that next year when we went to visit that den, it was their worst den visit of all six years of their right. study. Yep. And so I couldn't end the film there at this emotional spike in adrenaline. So I, that's when I had to decide, all right, we're going another year, because at the end of that, they were going to take all the collars off. And it had a very natural conclusion. And then all the study was, you know, kind of the numbers were coming together, the discoveries were being made from the data, and a lot was materializing at that point. So it snowballed from short film, segment in a short film, to short film, to, you know, oh man, there's a lot more here. And, and, and I think it's 55 minutes in its current state? It's it's uh, not quite 59 in its festival cut. Yeah. Perfect. So, it you know, it, it works so well because, as I say, you know, how you've um, incorporated the highs and lows. But also, I, I think the benefit of filming that long is that you were then able to pull out characters like bear characters specific bears because they uh, and correct me if i'm wrong i think we were talking they had collared 600 bears they tagged 600 bears they were collaring female adult females um and so when they'd catch a bear if it was sexually mature and it was female then they would typically put a collar on it and so at any given time they had a little more than 40 collars online for the duration of the six years. And so what came out from that was that one of the kind of um, protagonists, if you like, one of the main characters in there is Bear B7. And it's the seventh bear that was collared. And that, it, it, I guess because you filmed, and tell, you tell me, but because you filmed for so long, you were able to really build a storyline up about that one particular bear. Well, that's the other aspect of why this film went from short to long form, is that um, I th I think God intervened because I randomly was sent to all, of all the bears I could have visited that winter when they assigned me to two dens in those first two days. One of them was B7, who's this notorious town bear who they thought would likely have cubs. And, um, and so what was interesting about that is then B7 ends up ha getting into multiple scenarios that year where they were able to tell me, hey, B7's cubs got stuck in somebody's garage and it became quite this story. You should you ought to you know check in with this guy. Um, and then one of B7's cubs has been put down by a wildlife officer. You need to you know you could check out the scenario. So suddenly B7 it wasn't just see you next year. It was the adventures of B7 throughout the year and the perils that the cubs faced and you know what would become of of them became a much bigger question. The stakes were raised. And so she she became the natural character on which we focused in terms of the bear characters in the film. Yeah, and it works so well because I think, you know, having a storyline where you invest emotionally into a character like that, it just helps push the story along. And, and, and you want to see, I, I believe, the first year she had three cubs and they all died for various reasons. And so there's that emotional kind of dip of, oh gosh, she lost all of her babies. And then the next year she has three more, which is kind of unheard of that they would have triplets twice in a row. Um, and again, she starts losing some and one uh, survives, I believe, you know, it's, it's just taking you, you're, you're hoping that her cubs are going to survive and she's going to stay away from town and you, you're invested in her future. And, and that comes across well in the film. Well, thanks. Yeah. And it's interesting to note that, um, you know, one of the things I learned through that is B7 had to lose that first set of triplets early enough in the summer to then go back into estrus so that she could have cubs because bears reproduce every other year. Right. And so like the, if that indicates any level of peril that an urban bear faces that you can lose three cubs fast enough in the summer to then have cubs the next winter 
I mean, that's yeah, it's it's, it's that's stark. Astonishing. Yes, yeah, for sure. And, and uh, again, there's um, uh, no doubt because of the length of time you're able to film, we were able to see good years, good berry years, so good foraging for the bears up in the mountains. And then the years where I think there was one year where it just dipped. It was terrible. There was no forage, no berries. Uh, and really, we then saw the bears coming down into town and spending their their summer and their their fall in town foraging. Yeah, yeah, and we we covered the last two years of the study, um, but 2017, like right now, as we look at the next version of the film, 2017 was another food failure year. They've done another hair snare survey. We're waiting to get that statistic back, which may change the end of our film as oh, we get those numbers. So um, they've already done the, the snaring of the hair, and so they've sent it off to a lab to see how many unique bears are, are identifiable in the area. So, yeah, but it's interesting to think about how, you know, time becoming a character and how, that, how the team coalesces and their relationships develop and how Lyle's progression as the trapper, you know, how, how that unfolds and his changing attitudes and evolution of his character. Um, and, you know, so so it, it is really interesting to have time become a character because you can and, and the other the other aspect of that that's really cool for us was that was really when some of those major discoveries started becoming evident from the data set as they were getting time. They dialed in their systems on the study and they were able to focus more on mining into that huge data set of millions and millions of points of data. Um, they were starting to figure out those trends and it was really jarring and eye opening and, and whatnot. So sticking with the story for time like that in a way that, um, you know, typically the news cycle couldn't, you know, that's where documentary film can live and provide an interesting avenue for storytelling that uh, our, our short attention span news cycle can't. Right. And yeah, it works so well with the, the different characters you have in there because you have the, the, the head biologist um, and I can't remember her name now. Heather Johnson. Heather Johnson. So Heather, you have her as the head biologist. You then have Lyle, who, as you said, is a great character because he's a hunter. He's hunted a bear a year, I believe, for, for how many years? When they first started doing bear studies of this nature in Colorado, they looked up the hunting records to see who was the most successful hunter. Right. And Lyle was the most successful hunter. Right. So they recruited him to come to the research side and start helping them figure out how to find these large carnivores. And he is a master. The, what's amazing is Lyle, is, there's PhDs and master's students and everyone listed on these papers, and Lyle's name is right in the midst of them. That's great. And I have no idea what Lyle's educational background is, but he has a PhD in animal tracking. Right, he has the experience. Yeah. And so much of the time when um, wildlife ecologists, biologists are, are doing a study. It's the first time they're getting their hands on live animals. And so he had that experience. And, and, and what's so great is his passion that comes across. And at first it's like, oh, this guy's been killing bears for so many years. And then at the end of it, you just see how passionate he's like, I would never kill a bear again because I'm just so emotionally attached to them. He, he's he's turned and not that he didn't like them in the first place that's not that all hunters don't like animals right sure but but just this transition of his character from you know being a hunter to i i couldn't kill another bear because now i've got to hold so many cubs and i've got to be part of this process and he has a different kind of respect for it yeah uh, and that really comes across great character yeah, it's, it's an interesting, and it's a really interesting scene depending on the audience that we're screening with as to how they perceive Lyle's transformation right, and, and how they read into that. And, and so it's, that was a lesson for us in terms of leaving, leaving it be and not, you know, we were, we were very careful in different parts to not put music. We didn't want to inform how you should feel about Lyle's statements about that. Interesting, yeah. We didn't want to inform you about how to feel about the more intense den visit. Because we didn't want to over-dramatize that. It's intense enough as it That's is. That's right, yeah. And, and we don't need to infuse telling you how to think musically. Other parts, you know, we'll put music to heighten the comedy of it or, you know, different things like that when we're looking at a barrel full of maggots. <laughs> right, uh, right. But, uh, yeah, so there, there was... It's, it was an interesting thing to walk that line of how to share some of those stories for sure. So this is really interesting because it sounds like you have a very good understanding of story and of music and how to affect an audience with that. So tell us a bit about your background 
where have you gained that experience from? Because this is, and correct me if I'm wrong again, this is your first kind of feature length film, yeah. wildlife film. So where, where did you gain that experience and knowledge of storytelling? Yeah, so uh, experience and knowledge of storytelling in general or music, I guess? Like, I, th I think, first of all, just storyline, you know, sure. building that story out and understanding Carol. You, you know, one of the things I get asked a lot is, you know, filmmakers who are creating their own projects, their own films, can get so bogged down or overwhelmed by, like, what gear they need, how are they going to film it, the formats, this, that, and the other, that they almost miss the most important part, which is storytelling, right? You've got to have a great story up front. And it's just, you know, you've taken this on. You were the DP. Basically, you were, you filmed the entire movie. Did By 95%. 95%. Yeah. You, you were telling a great story. You knew how to put the music in there to affect your audience. Um, just, you know, in general, where did you get that knowledge from? Because I yeah. know a lot of filmmakers struggle with that. Yeah. Yeah, so my sojourn into film is interesting in that as a fourth grader, I wrote on a Christmas wish list that I wanted to, a drum set. My fourth grade teacher read that, called my parents, and said, hey, I have this antique snare drum that I played as a young girl, and I want Dusty to have it. And so I started taking drum lessons as a result in fourth grade on a snare drum. Right. The first drum set came in sixth grade. And then that really music saved me from the darkness that is middle school. Yeah. Um, and I found mentors and older friends that were, that were creative and engaged in the arts that could teach me drum lessons, you know, friends that were four years older than me and I could see uh, the happiness that they were experiencing through art. And then it was through playing in bands with friends that those were the kids that got access to the first video cameras. So from, from the earliest JVC digital video camcorder, that's when I got a hold of you know someone's mom's camera that she didn't care if we borrowed it, and we started blowing stuff up and filming it and you know all of that. And and there was no YouTube; it was a school broadcast system where they played the announcements every morning. So I was the president of a ping pong club that was merely an excuse to have whatever we wanted school sponsored. <laughs> right. Make crazy videos of jumping a Ford Taurus four feet into the air to advertise our next social wow. and play it in front of the whole school. So we got had this audience where we were testing and testing and trying and and scheming and making these these ads and these videos and and whatnot. So I and then you know event planning came with that with student council and so it, it all kind of swirled together to to the point where um, between music and film and events and comedy, we've planned so many you know things of that nature. You just you start to relish the bringing things together and and crafting that perfect experience for your audience whether it's something live or something that's taped and uh and so you've seen a lot of failure along the way in doing those types of things um and and so then in school i studied business and i minored in film at brigham young university and then uh just kind of stuck with that and and started telling stories uh, uh, the first documentary i made i had I did an internship in Mozambique and I was teaching economics classes to professors in training that would then be sent out to rural schools to teach. But while I was there, I, I bought my first camera with the help of my grandparents who are, um, who are remembered at the end of Verza Durango. And, uh, and I was able to shoot a, a short documentary about the agro -ec economy of collard greens there following a woman who harvests and sells collard greens door to door. And that led to me getting hired to, you know, as soon as I graduated, I went with a group to the Philippines and over to film a trek into Everest Base Camp. And wow. I, that first job I did and traded, they paid for the gear. I kept the gear and did the project. Nice. And I still have that camera and I still have that, you know, I just lost that tripod on a shoot recently. Um, but those, you know, just really scrappy. Um, but you have to, I think in the same way with bears, you know, it's no one's going to pay you to do the thing that you want to do until you can show that you've done it in this space that we're trying to operate in uh, no one's going to hand you that opportunity and i've i've never never been the one that just gravitates toward like where's the bottom rung on the ladder i'm going to start climbing that it's like well, i don't need permission i'm just going to go talk talk my way into going to that bear den you know and i'll borrow a camera and and i'll sleep on someone's floor or in my car or I'll spring for the cheapest motel in town, which I did in Durango, and got and found bed bugs in the bed, <laughs> <laughs> and had to run all of my gear and then my bags and everything, anything I could, I put in a deep freezer for four days at a time, oh. cycling it through before I brought it back into my house because wow. I was so paranoid <laughs> that I was gonna bring bed bugs home. So you know, it's it's gritty, but uh, you know that's 
through that process, you see things that fail, you see things that succeed, uh, you see the sh and a lot of short form content, short documentaries. Um, you get to collaborate on other friends' projects and stuff, and it's it's you know you see what works and doesn't. I think through that grind. So really, it's a, it's an e evolving thing. You, you you've taken all of these things you know. You're a musician. You've picked up a camera. You're a filmmaker, and you just merge them all together. Yeah, and, and it works. And and you went to film school, so you learned the art of storytelling at some point as well. I'm yeah, assuming. Yeah, yeah. So uh, at BYU, there is story focused film program, and uh, the the teachers I had there were terrific. Ben Ungren is an incredible professor who's no longer there at that university, but uh, taught us you know great skills and ways to think in visual processes. He made us go shoot a process documentary, and then we all put our tapes in a hat, and everyone had to draw out a tape and go edit somebody else's. Oh, nice. Um, and he forced you to edit your own stuff on other projects so that you could see how badly you were shooting it. Right. <laughs> and, and why didn't I hold still for three <laughs> seconds? Yeah. Why am I always moving? And, and and you learn you know, the hard way through that grind uh, of... Man, I, you know, I need to hold here, and I'm going to come in close here, and you know, starting to do that type of stuff. And then the nice thing about it for me is I taught myself guitar starting in high school. Uh, my parents forced me to take nine years of piano lessons, which I fought like crazy. <laughs> but between drums and guitar and piano, um, then I have a, I, to the annoyance of my composer that I work with, Micah, on a regular basis, I have very strong opinions on music and ideas of how that can reinforce and whatnot. So it, with Bears of Durango, you, I don't know if you noticed, we use a lot of pizzicato strings, so plucking of violins and cellos and a, and a string ensemble. And our, our thought there was, here you have highbrow science. I mean, these are really very qualified scientists handling maggots and bear poop and, you know, it's so blue collar so many of the responsibilities that they have that we love the juxtaposition of pizzicato strings with a bucket f a, a barrel full of maggots yes yeah and uh, and so that's that juxtaposition of the hilarity of of how horrible some of those tasks are that they have to perform with the the outcome that is really robust science that can inform policy that can change the way that we perceive large carnivores so it's it's a joy to get to experiment and play in in that type of playground, and it, I I teared up and it, it, at this when we got to use a full string ensemble to record the score, um, for the first few minutes, and then I realized that Micah was going too slow, and so it was time to crack the whip, and, uh, and so we we got after it, and and not Micah was going too slow, it was it was that we were it took us too long to get through the first cue, and sure. we're like, shoot, <laughs> we have one day here, and so the emotion quickly is replaced by producer mode. Right. You get people back on the ball and whatnot. And that's so important because, you know, this is one of those things. As a filmmaker these days, we're pretty much, most of us as kind of one person crews are taking on every role. And this is where overwhelm can easily strike. You know, you've got this, you've got this pressure on you. You're trying to keep to a budget. You're managing people. You're trying to think of storyline. You're, you're dealing with equipment failure or issues when they happen. What... It, Explain some of the biggest problems you had on this uh, production. I mean, it's a long production. Yeah. You're hiking up mountains. You've got gear, gear that isn't even yours. So you've, you've got to familiarize yourself, no doubt, with that gear. What, what were some of the biggest issues that you faced? Yeah. I mean, so, so I think most of the problems with this production, most of the hardest things have come with, with the creep of the scope. So... When we went from short film to to longer form, it's f you know five times as long as we intended it to be, and so in some of those expenses can be five times as great, and but we did our you know we ran a Kickstarter when we thought we were doing a short film, and so you know your your budget you're executing on a project that's five times as long, but you know you raised X amount of money, so um, as far as like the biggest. The biggest issues have been financial, for sure. Right. So we had uh, we were able to energize some folks that got excited about being involved with the project, and they committed to raise an amount of, of sum of money that was significant for me. I mean, it's not earth shattering for a network or anything like that, but for me, it was unobtainable. And so, with their blessing, we went down this path. Um, when I asked, this is an important part of this. When I asked them what they wanted back they said, well, you know, we just want to help. And so 
I tried desperately through the ups and downs of of some insensitive conversations that some of them had that soiled the relationship with uh, an, a fiscal sponsor, which then left all of that funding that they had lined up hung up and with nowhere to go through a tax deductible vehicle. I tr kept trying to spin it positive and find solutions and whatnot. And it, this has taken an extra year and a half to do that. And it, and finally, you know, what, what it came to is I needed to press them on, hey, you've committed to this. And, I, and here it is over and over again in your texts and your emails. And here's some really big talk about all these folks that you're, you're interacting with about this. And the, the time is far spent where we need you to deliver on that. And I, I wrote that letter and I had five people read it. I let it sit for two weeks to make sure that it was the right tone. And the response was so unbelievably toxic and telling me that I was greedy and just, just kind of pretty unreal. And and so it became clear that for these folks it was it was uh, they felt embarrassed by some of the mistakes that they made along the way. It was a vanity project for them in the first place. If you know, if, and and when their only reward is feeling good, it's really hard to get someone under contract when it's out of the goodness of their heart. And so that you know, I don't know if we would have done it different. The the greatest gift that those folks have given to the project is that we move forward boldly within the confines of the the amount that we agreed to to go after and and with that boldness we've made a strong film and, and that that comes down to your commitment <clears throat> and sticking with it because it when these things happen especially with funding it's so easy just to say you know what this is bigger than i can handle we can't do this we you know this is just taking all my time because one of the things is when we talk about funding most of the time that's not funding your time a lot of the time it's funding expenses it might be gear rental it might be other cr uh, staff crew a lot of the time the person making the film is not getting paid is spending a ton of their own money it, it's you know getting yourself in debt i mean that's the the, you have to have the passion to back everything else up. And um, and I think that comes across with you and, and what you've done with this and how long it's taken. Yeah. Um, where are you with that now? And, and, and just moving along to where we're at. We're, you're yeah. at the last festival. You're here. You're actually raising money now to move forward. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. I think it's important to note before we move on to that, that, that true transparency, like this, is, this has been one of the toughest years of my adult life doing wow. this. Yeah. Uh, and and depression has been a real thing, and I've had to to face that with the burnout that's associated with sure. just a little farther, just a little farther, just a little farther, and you can push yourself too far. Yeah. And and that really was a thing for me, and so so I'm in a much better place now, um, and I think the festival circuit gets you out from underneath a rock, and you get to interact with other filmmakers who have been through it, who have been through the rodeo enough to help mentor you and are willing yeah. to. Yeah. There are very kind and dedicated people out there who will listen to you on the phone for two hours and and consult with you on how best to navigate these things and tell you based on their experience what numbers they've seen and and that's so important to find that and in t and until you get out from under that rock that is your own little vacuum because you know in my world nobody else who else do i know that's making films about bears right. living in salt lake city you know uh it's, yeah. there's it's it's a weird thing that i'm doing right yeah and and everyone thinks it's very cool from the outside but none of my peers know the first thing about how to help absolutely or, or yeah. how to how you know how to navigate this so it's important to get out and find that network and the festival circuit if anything the 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 funding on our film being held up and eventually you know needing to come from other sources it, it's caused me to meet exponentially more people and contacts and wonderful filmmakers than I would have had the funding just come in. Yes. So, so the silver lining is the future is bright. Uh, in the moment, I'm still navigating the pickle, but I can see, hey, this is, these are, this is in, in, you know, under that pressure is where the real diamonds start to emerge. Yeah, that's so valid because I think as filmmakers, we all know we've all been there. It's, this isn't a career path you can get into and just everything's laid out in front of you and someone's paying you a salary and, you know, um, it, it's it's a fight. It's a struggle. And um, I think you have put that, that very well and yeah. you've shown that. Well, and, and even even now, and we talked about this yesterday, but the the industry is transitioning so quickly that even the those the gray hair in the room at these festivals, you ask them for a suggestion on how to navigate something, they'll shrug at you. 
because they're trying to, they have to figure it out right now too. It's moving so quickly. So in the paradigm shift, there's opportunity, but people consulting you on what to do now are experts of the past. And so it's a, it's a fascinating time to, to be a part of that. So, so to, to bring it to present day though, with bears of Durango, yes, the, the situation is, is looking good, but we still have some opportunity ahead of us to try to figure out how to capitalize on. So we're coming to the close of a really successful festival run. A number of awards, great recognition, um, great exposure for the film. We're at roughly $80,000 in, in ad equivalent in terms of the public exposure we've generated for the project and the issue through all the newspaper articles, television interviews, radio interviews. And so, and so we've, been, we've been able to generate a huge amount of exposure for the project to the tune of tens of thousands of dollars worth of exposure through radio, television, print, magazine articles, newspapers. It's, it's been quite successful in that regard and generated some great publicity for the issue, for the film. Um, but what's ahead now is, uh, is trying to get it onto, you know, to recoup its budget and to get, get it to the widest audience possible. And so the current state in which I'm in is how can I, I've created an award-winning film. So if folks bring in money now, they can see the film. They're not, they're not betting on me as a first time filmmaker. They can watch it and I've removed that risk. So I'm hope I'm hopeful that that's a selling point. Absolutely. Yeah. And then the other side of it is I've been able to line up a national distributor that believes that we can reach 70 to 80% of the American populace or American households um, through public television. That's fantastic. And and with that, we have the opportunity to, to attach underwriters to the pro- production such that those who fund the project can receive recognition in front of those all of those households. So in as a business person, it's been my goal to eliminate the risk by creating the film to this point and, and then validating it through the festival circuit with awards and recognition and whatnot. And then also have a letter of intent from a national distributor saying, yes, this is a pipeline that we believe that will succeed to this degree based on our many, many years of experience with this type of programming. So the hope is there's just one transaction here in the middle that needs to happen to unleash this. And so if the folks care about the cause, if they care about the content, if they care about seeing a female researcher as the hero protagonist of a film, any of those things or all of those things, put the coin in and it's going to go. That's fantastic. Listen, Dusty, we we have got our film showing in about 25 minutes. Oh, so we're, we're going to have to run, but very quickly. Yes. Um, last question okay. or a last piece of advice. If you had to give one piece of advice from everything you've learned to new aspiring filmmakers out there, people who are struggling through the things you've been through, people who are just trying to find their way in this industry. Yeah. What would be the one piece of most important advice you could give someone? In relation to the conversation we've had today, I think what's really interesting in having attended these festivals is the festivals have been a great way to meet a lot of people and expand my network. But I could have come to all of these festivals with a three-minute film. I didn't need a 60-minute film to get here. Interesting. And for four years, while I'm working on Bears of Durango, and I'm talking to clients, whether that's in the ad world or other films or, you know, whatever, I don't have a portfolio that's updated in that time. If I'm, if I'm full bore into this film, which I, you know, I was working on side projects for parts of it, but, uh, as a young filmmaker, I think incrementally you can increase the scope of your projects, but we bit off a big bite and I don't regret that now, but it's been very difficult. And I think somebody else starting out, I would tell them, Hey, look, you can be at these festivals with a three minute film. So so don't bite off more than you can chew. Try to define a time period where you know the story is going to start and end in this much time in, in terms of how much time you need to cover it. And you have the budget and the resources to finish and finish strong. And then get it into festivals and get out here and start meeting folks. And, and, and I think um, that incremental growth to your portfolio, people, again, they want to see what you've done not what you say you can do or what you've got 75% done or half done or 10% done. You know, and for a long time I was that guy with four different projects that were all, trust me, they're getting <laughs> there one day. someday. <laughs> right. And that's a harder pitch. Yeah. And so I think if you can really be honest with yourself with the resources, your skill set, the team you have, 
the and the time frame it's going to take to tell that story don't don't go over the scope that's realistic for where you are right now because more incremental steps and more pieces will show somebody hey look this guy's capable hey look she's totally she's totally primed to now direct this 30 minute piece because of these three five minute pieces that she's done and and i think that that incrementalness of that um i just i bit off way more than that and and i've paid the price um and i i hope that it it, it is opening new opportunities for me but man it's hurt it could know. have been easier it, 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 it may have it may have been a lot easier to to do that incrementally yeah well, that's that's great advice. Great advice. And very quickly before we have to run, yeah. where can people connect with you? Where can they find out more about the film? And most importantly, if they want to donate and help the film move to its next level, where can they do that? Yes. So connecting with me, probably best done through Instagram. And my, my handle is at Dusty Hewlett, D-U-S-T-Y-H-U-L-E-T. And I'd love to connect with folks there. Um, Bears of Durango has a Facebook page. And it also has a website. So it's, it's just Bears of Durango on Facebook. Bearsofdurango.com is the website. And on the website, you can find information about you know, where we are with the project, what we're trying to do. And also, there's a, a portal there through which you can make a tax-deductible contribution to the project, um, currently through our fiscal sponsor, Mountain Studies Institute. And so that's all linked there. And, uh, but yeah, I'd be stoked to connect with people. I mean, that's the reason why we're here is is to broaden that network to get out from the hovel that I've lived in trying to make this movie and, and connect with everybody else out there. So Absolutely. add me on Instagram, drop me a line. I would love to chat with you. Great stuff. And we will also put all of those links on our Master Wildlife Filmmaking Podcast this episode page. So directly where people are listening to this now, if they're on the Master Wildlife Filmmaking page, we'll put all of your links so awesome. people can connect. Dusty, thanks so much. Yeah. Fantastic. Love the film. Thank Great you. chatting with you and I appreciate you being here. Awesome. Thanks so much. If you've enjoyed this episode of the Master Wildlife Filmmaking Podcast, then please leave a rating and a comment. And remember to subscribe to keep up to date with the series' future episodes. You can find out more information about wildlife filming at jakewillers.com. And if you're interested in starting a career in the wildlife filmmaking industry or being mentored to further your career, then please visit jakewillers.com forward slash mentorship. Thanks for listening.